Hello my beautiful friends, so today we're going to talk about how to choose your PhD topic and I'll share with you the mistakes that I made that I don't want you to make. If you're new to this channel, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell notification, it means a lot to me. Also, thank you so much to all of my current subscribers. I've passed 5,000 and I just can't believe it. So thank you and I hope to be providing value to your daily life and your PhD choices. Okay, let's get on with the topic. So choosing a PhD topic is a little bit more than choosing something that you're just simply interested in. Um, it can be easy to think, oh, I'm really passionate about this thing, or, you know, I really want to find out more about this other topic. But in reality, you have to do something. And there's a sort of really simple way to keep yourself interested for three years. And that's just focus on something other than what you are solely interested in. And we'll talk about that now. So I'm going to share with you my five top things and five steps that I think you should consider while choosing a PhD topic. And also I'll share with you the mistakes that I made along the way. So hopefully you don't make the same mistakes. Um, but yeah, this is with the goal of choosing something that not only will provide something and a value to the scientific field that you're trying to contribute to, but also that you can choose something that is actually going to keep you interested for three to four years. Okay, the first thing, and this is the most important. Now, you'll hear a lot of other people talk about choose something you're interested in, Completely agree. That is a very important part of the process, but you have to go a little bit deeper because it's not good enough just to say, oh, I think I'm interested in, in my case, solar technology. Um, because that's the mistake I made is, yeah, you may be interested in it, but what are you actually going to do during that PhD investigation? So for me, I wish I had chosen something that was a little bit more people-based, a little bit less stuck in the lab looking down, you know, like, I don't know how I would have molded that and maybe I wouldn't have even chosen, uh, you know, to do kind of a physics slash chemistry um, sort of mix, but it, it was something that I was like, oh, the act of doing, like, the, the way I answer this question or this field is all in the lab, on your own, head in a fume cupboard, um, head in a glove box, like that is how that process worked. So what I suggest you do is look at something you're interested in, but also go one step deeper and be like, how do you do that research? Like, is it going out and speaking to people? Is it reading? Is it synthesis? Is it sitting down with your thoughts and struggling with questions over and over again? Like, you've got to actually enjoy the process of the research and not just the topic and uh, I think that's uh, the sort of like the biggest mistake that a lot of people make is they go oh I'm interested in this area but really they should be saying well do I want to do the thing that answers that question if you want to work in the field like I wish I had worked more in the field got out you know like solar technology you put solar cells out into the world, but I was stuck inside in a glove box for about three years. Um, and you know, that's just the reality of doing that sort of research. But if you wanna get out in the field, choose a topic that allows you to get out in the field. If you wanna to speak to people, get out and choose a field that allows you to speak to people. You know, speak to current uh, students that are researching a similar topic and ask them, what does their day look like? like are they out? Are they in? Are they bored? Are they happy? Like all of these things are so important because that is how you make sure you last through the entire three years and you don't go mental. The second step is all about niching down your ideas until you come across something that is small enough to ask a specific question about, um, but not so small that it limits the possibilities of your research. So um, it can be a hard balancing act and, and there's no easy sort of like solution to this 
other than, you know, we've talked about choose something that you're interested in and you will actually enjoy the process of doing the PhD and then niche down. So in my experience, I was like, oh, renewable technology, that's great. Um, I was looking for solar cells, great. And then as I'm sort of going deeper and deeper, what sort of research is there in the solar cell world? So literally for me, it was niching down because solar cells are made up of layers and I focused in on the active layer. Um, the active layer is the part of the solar cell that absorbs the light and splits it up into electrons and holes. And then that creates the electricity that can be drawn out through the electrodes. But you know, I, it wasn't just good enough to say solar technology. I had to niche down what's in solar technology. Well, there's engineering, there's the layers, there's polymer chemistry. Um, you know, even with, within solar cells, there are so many different types of solar cells that I could have focused on one and not the other. And as times change, you know, the one I was working on, organic photovoltaics, completely switched and they became unsexy and unfashionable. And then perovskites, pretty much as soon as I finished my PhD, everyone switched to perovskite solar cells. I don't even know what the popular one is right now, um, but I'm sure it's slightly different to where it was even a few years ago. Um, so yeah, niche down, just keep, finding smaller and smaller components of that research area. And there's no reason why you can't say, actually that niche doesn't interest me at all. What about a, a one next to it? What about another aspect of the same topic? Um, and then always asking that question, well, what do you do to answer that research question? You know, for me, like I said, it was in the lab. Um, always keep that at the forefront of your mind when niching down, because that will make sure that you last the distance um, and importantly, and this is kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but if you're unsure, this is where you should speak to a research supervisor. Um, reach out to academics and start saying, well, I've got a general interest in this area. Can you help me uh, niche down my ideas into, um, into things that can be sort of put into a research question? Yes. Okay, number three is you have to look at the research area. So the research area um, involves going away, reading the literature, looking at past dissertations. Now go check out my other video, which is on uh, how to write a literature review. I'll link that above, wherever that goes. Um, and there you'll be able to see exactly what the process is for going through the literature. Um, but importantly, the way, one thing in this early stage when we're formulating an idea, it's not about you know, doing a massive literature review, it's just about going in, finding something that's, um, that's going into the niche you've just chosen and seeing what the literature is like because a huge part of the PhD process is reading what other people have done, right? And if reading what other people have done doesn't at least keep your interest a little bit, change the idea. Like that's the only way you're gonna get through it. You know, I was so fed up reading uh, the same iterations of, you know, solar cells with different kind of efficiencies and this and that. And then it was, you know, it was a trying time to have to go through the literature, but that is what makes you an expert is having a current sort of knowledge and a, an evol a evolving knowledge of the research area. Um, and yeah, I, I just didn't keep up with literature because it was so very boring and that, that definitely impacted my ability to do better in my PhD. So yeah, go away, have a look at literature, um, check out that video, like I said, but also look at past dissertations of research done in that field. A dissertation gives you much more of an idea of what a PhD looks like in that area because typically, um, you know, they'll be split up into chapters. You'll have an introduction and just read the abstract, the introduction. You don't have to worry about the methodology, maybe skim to the conclusions, but ultimately that is what you will be producing if you go down this field, this down into this kind of like topic area. And so if producing something like that doesn't interest you, then start with the end in mind and go, you know what? I am not excited to get to that area. So why, why would you bother, right? Like you've got to ask yourself, put your ego aside. Um, do you want to produce a massive, thick, 
book, a hefty tome about this area because if you go find ex examples and you don't like the look of them, then yeah, don't do it, right? Number four is all about finding the gaps in the current research that's out there. Now, the thing is, is that even though you do have to repeat people's experiments in the early stage, you have to have that inquisitive mind to be like, well, they've done that, but what if? What if we change the solution? What if we try to make it more environmentally friendly? What if um, they didn't do it properly? Like, those are sort of questions that you should always write down. And what I recommend is as you're reading the literature in the step before, is that you write down the questions that pop into your mind, even if they're just very simple questions. Um, and, you know, it's just like, what if they had done this differently? What if they had chosen the wrong subset of things to uh, explore? What if they changed this very small parameter? You know, that doesn't look like it's been explored very well. And so what you'll end up with after, let's say like a half a day of reading the literature is a list of these questions. Um, and that's your first indication of the sorts of gaps that may exist. Um, and then as you're reading more and more, if someone answers your question, cross it off. And then what you'll end up with is a big old list of potential topics and research questions that then you can give to a research supervisor and be like, look, this is what I've come across. This is what I've read. These are the gaps and the questions that I had while reading the literature. Can you help me work them out? Is this a good topic? Can we combine some of the topics? You know, can we niche up, niche down? Those are the sorts of kind of exploratory um, questions you need to ask once you've got that big list of your questions. Okay, number five is, and I've touched on it a little bit, is go and speak to a potential research supervisor. So go check out my other video on how to choose a research supervisor. There's loads of um, kind of tips and tricks in there that will help you. But here's, here's the little caveat when choosing a topic. Now, PhD supervisors as Clever as they are, remember that they are only clever in one very, very small aspect of the world, right? Now, the issue that I have seen time and time again is that these people like to bring their same expertise to multiple research questions. For example, um, there is someone uh, that I know, a research supervisor, that has one type of machine. He has one instrument and he puts everything through this one instrument. And look, it's a good instrument, but sometimes it just doesn't answer the question. So there's an old saying that goes, if you have a hammer, you'll see everything as a nail. And I cannot sort of tell you how many times I've seen that in the research field. I actually did a, um, I, I was a like, scribe for the formulation of this center of excellence, right? Literally, I was there to write up the ideas on the board. At the beginning of the day, everyone was like, oh, let's, you know, think outside the box and let's do all these amazing things. By the end of the day, and arguably by the afternoon, everyone was just pushing their own little tiny fraction of research into the research questions they'd come up with. And I was like, what is the point? You know what these people's research expertise are, and if they're not gonna think out of the box and just bring the same old stuff they do time and time again to this center of excellence, what's the point of this meeting, right? Like, yeah, and that was incredibly frustrating. So the idea about speaking to potential supervisors is a good idea as long as you understand that they are gonna see your research question from the skills and techniques that they are bringing from their years of doing research. Now it could be that thing is perfectly suited to answering your research question, brilliant. Arguably, it isn't, right? Like just question after your meeting with them, just be like, is there a better way to actually answer this question? Have they helped me? Are they just bringing, essentially, are they taking the easy option out by just bringing the bits that they know and forcing it onto this research question? And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a reality. These people are just people and they like to keep things simple for themselves. And if they've got a set of expertise, they very rarely like to step outside of it. 
Now, when you give them the research topics, talk them through, let them help you mold the ideas so that you come up with a simple research topic. Now that should be about 10 to 15 words and the research topic and question um, needs to be kind of set in stone and really well thought about early on. Uh, because if it doesn't and if, it, if the goal pulse goalposts move and if the topic shifts and morphs like it's okay but you don't really want to do that too much because ultimately you only have three to four years and you want to make sure that that topic is rock solid um, and in the first year you'll find out if it is. So there we have it. There are my ways of making sure that you choose a PhD topic that suits you and not the supervisor. Um, and yeah, making sure that you can actually enjoy the process of a PhD. Focus on the doing aspect. What do you actually have to do for three years? Not what do you have to think about? What sort of field are you in? Like what literally does a day-to-day -day life for a PhD research uh, student answering that question look like and if it doesn't excite you or if you know it's just a little bit boring and arguably you know they kind of are sometimes um don't worry about it move on look for something else because you have to go through this you have to push through for at least three to four years and i want to make sure that you enjoy the process and that uh yeah it is a success. If you're new to this channel, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell notification. And if this video was helpful for you, please remember to give it a thumbs up and share it with other people who you think it could help. Until next time, have a fabulous day, week, month, or whatever it is, and I shall see you in the next video.